All right, everybody, welcome to today's video. Today we're gonna to be talking about um, logical operations. And so with that, we'll talk about logical and or not or XOR. Um, XOR is probably one that's new to you if you um, So today we're going to talk about logical operators, logical and, logical or, uh, not, and XOR. Uh, you should be familiar with the top three, not logical and or not. You probably saw those in 150, 250 programming courses. Um, one of those building blocks of, of basic logic and, and making our programs, or giving our programs the ability to make decisions. Um, XOR you don't typically encounter until you get to a course like this, uh, and we'll go through those all today. So well, first we'll start off with the bitwise AND. And so what we're looking for here is to take two inputs, so we're taking these two numbers here. Uh, these two numbers, again, just as kind of a refresher, uh, we have two 8-bit numbers. We just count the number of places, and we have eight, did, eight, eight places here, so we have eight bits. Um, so we're taking these two numbers and we're performing the bitwise AND on those two numbers. We only get the result then, when we do this, the result is a one only if both of the inputs are one. So both of these values being our inputs need to be a one. So in this case, zero, zero results in a zero. One, zero results in a zero because they're not the same. Zero, zero results in a zero. One, zero results in a zero. Okay, continue, continue. Um, and now we get to one, one. Both one, so our output results in the one as well as it does there. It's important to notice here though, this is not addition. Right? If this was addition, then we'd have carries and we'd have uh, a different a different result based off of this operation. This is a bitwise end. And so we're looking at these two numbers. That result of that end will only result in another number, either a 1 or a 0. And we don't have to worry about the addition component or any carries or anything like that. Okay, for the next slide, here's a table that breaks down all those possible values. So you can see, just as with that previous example, that the only time that we have the output being a one is when the inputs are both one. Uh, every other case here, the result is a zero. Okay, how about bitwise or? If one is a one, then it produces a one. And so, uh, kind of like when you, you look at the truthfulness of a statement, you know, a logical or in an if statement. If one or the other is true, then the overall condition is true. And we have the same concept here. So only one value needs to be uh, needs to be a one in order for the result to be a one. So this is a zero, this is a one, this is a zero, this is a one, 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 one. Right, and that becomes our result. Here you can see a table, very similar. Um, this is almost the exact opposite though of what we just got done talking about. That is that the only time that we get a zero is when both of the values are zero. Otherwise everything else results in a one. Okay, uh, as far as the bitwise or, so that's an exclusive or. And what this operation is looking for then is that each bit needs to be different. It needs to be exclusive. And so um, they must be different in order to generate a one. They are exclusively different. So we have uh, zero, zero, that is a zero. One, zero, they're different. So that gives us a one. This is a zero. This is a one, because both, both inputs are different. This is a one, this is a one. This is a zero, and this is a zero, right? And so that's the result of doing that. Um, there's a couple of things that that, ex, that this XOR uh, operation is used for, exclusive OR. Uh, it's used in a lot of encryption or cryptography. And so if you get to a point where you're looking at, especially at a, at a reverse engineering kind of a level, um, where you're looking at a lot of uh, uh, disassembly of programs that are doing cryptography, you'll see XOR. Uh, the other thing is you'll see um, XOR being used to set a value to zero. And so uh, if you take two numbers, and let's just, I'm just gonna prefer for simplicity's sake here. Uh, let's say that we take the same value and we XOR it together, what do we get? We get a zero. And so sometimes you'll see that in order to set a register's value to zero, um, you might see an XOR operation to do that. Right, and we'll take some look at we'll take a look at that as an example here once we get into the actual code portion of the course, which is coming up very soon. Um, here's our table. Right, so the only time that we have a one being set is when they're different, which is this case right here. Right, a zero zero, a zero one one, a zero. Uh, otherwise, we're we're setting that because they're exclusively different. All right. 
Uh, bitwise not, pretty straightforward here, is that uh, just like th this negation, you know, not negates the exclamation point in most, most languages, um, it changes the meaning. If we negate something that's true, it becomes false. False becomes true. Uh, and we have the same, kind of the same thing happening here. Uh, and then if we negate this, if we say not, we just flip all the bits. And so now we have uh, ones become zeros and zeros become ones. All right, and there's a table. If it's zero, it's not. If it's x and not x, it just becomes the opposite. Okay, so um, we'll spend the next few minutes here just going through a little bit more background information. Um, again, we talk about uh, kind of some of the, the overall organization or, or you know how these the different components when it comes to the CPU and how things are processed. Um, there are some things that are that are important. Again, not so much to get through the course per se, uh, but just in having a better general understanding of how this works. Um, there is the arithmetic logic unit, and that is what does all the adding, subtracting, and, and other um, you know mathematical type operations. Um, there's a floating point unit, and the floating point unit then has its own set of instructions. Um, um, it has its own uh, stack space and some other things that um, we'll probably won't talk much about the floating point unit in the course. Uh, we'll have a data bus, and what the data bus is in most systems is it's a, a central uh, you know, piece of, of communication or ability for these different units here uh, to communicate with each other. And so, you know, say that we have the ALU and say that we have some registers and we have this data bus that's controlled, you know, electronically. Uh, our ability then for the ALU to be able to communicate and vice versa with those other components. And so uh, the data bus then is what kind of ties all these other things together. Uh, we have the registers. We just spent the last lecture talking about the registers. They're small, but they're very fast, uh, and they can be accessed through that data bus. Um, the clock and the clock cycle, that's going to be the smallest amount of time that it takes to execute an instruction. Um, however, some instructions take more than one clock cycle. And so if you really get into a point where you're you know, looking at fine-tuning in an application uh, because you're, you're programming at a very low level, uh, that might be something that you become interested in, is how many clock cycles a certain instruction needs to execute. Um, there is the ability then in the CPU to do branch prediction. And what that essentially is doing is it's trying to guess which branch a program will take. Um, we have talked about the, the fetch to code execute store cycle. And this becomes, you know, conceptually, or I guess the, the term is then the pipeline. Um, and as something's being fetched, then we, you know, we execute that in a cycle. And then that's our fetch one. And then we have a fetch two. And so while, or no, well, excuse me here. Let's see if I can erase that. So we have a fetch. And then in the next cycle, uh, that fetch moves on to decode. And now we fetch something else. And then we just continue to do that. Now that X moves to execute, the second fetch moves to decode, and now we fetch another instruction. And this becomes our pipeline here. Um, what happens then as we're going through this, uh, oftentimes what the operating system will do, what the CPU will do, is it'll try to predict uh, what branches, what logic to go down as it's, as it's going through this process of fetching, decoding, executing, and then storing. But because it oftentimes needs to uh, actually get the result of something, you know, the store, once we get to that step, it's it's executing instructions ahead of time. It's anticipating that. Um, oftentimes it's very good at that, and that improves the performance of, you know, of our systems, of our code, of, of the CPU. Uh, sometimes it isn't, and once the actual results comes in, it realizes that it, you know, went down the wrong branch and has to start over. It has to flush the pipeline and start over, and so then there's a little bit of a performance penalty there when it does that. And so, you know, there's things are, there's different units when you get down to that lower level, there's ways in which these different units can communicate with each other, um, and then there's other things like this branch prediction um, that just, it just really, really only wanted to point that out just to show how complex it really is and how much is being done all just with a, a series of ones and zeros. Uh, when it comes to memory access times, uh, this is again, and it's important to understand for performance reasons, and that we, we have something called an order of magnitude. And an order of magnitude in the terms of access time here is simply that when we go from you know, 10 to the power of 0 to, let's say, 10 to the power of 1, uh, when we change this value in the exponent, then that becomes an order of magnitude difference. And what you can see here is that in between, so we have registers, we have the caches, uh, main memory, hard drive, you know, these, these things get progressively slower, more expensive as far as access time goes. Um, we have changes by order of magnitude, you know, from 2 to 10, 
is about of an order of magnitude. So going from a register to a cache, going from um, this cache to main memory, you know, going from the L1, L2 cache to main memory, another order of magnitude difference. Uh, going from those and on, you know, we have order of magnitude or more differences. And that is just because as we're, as we're getting away from the registers, because remember the registers are going to be accessed or accessible at the same clock speed. And so they can execute at the same speed that the CPU is processing. And as we move away from those to access data, to get those instructions, uh, it just becomes more expensive and more costly. Right, uh, this is just a summary. We've been talking about this fetch, decode, execute, store. Um, you know, think about the code now based off of what we just talked about. Um, loading from orders of magnitude slower. You know, going from the caches, going from the registers, uh, to the memory, to the hard drive, to an internet, to the internet, you know, it gets more expensive. And we, this is where, when we go from, uh, you know, when we, when we go from, uh, we have an order of magnitude change, it's noticeable. Um, hard disk, you know, and even in, in this, this kind of world of hard drives, you know, there's an order of magnitude difference between the solid states and the, uh, the spinning disk, the old kind of traditional, and most systems these days have, uh, are now shipping with solid states. So what is a program? Well, we've talked a little bit about that last lecture when we talked about virtual memory and that a program is nothing more than bytes, ones and zeros stored on a disk. Uh, we still look at even on disk, we have those basic units of measure and, and we still typically organize things even on disk uh, by bytes. You know, so we don't typically reference four bits on a system. Um, when we go to execute a program, then what we do is the operating system searches the path. We have this path environment variable, uh, and that tells the operating system where to look to execute that. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, the program is in that directory and it's able to just execute immediately, and sometimes uh, we run into issues with that, right? And, and an example of that is when you first started 15250. If you did generated a program at the terminal and you got the A dot out, if you just at the terminal typed A dot out, then you would probably got received a message saying, uh, that the path cannot be found to execute this program or something along those lines. So you have to, you had to type in dot forward slash a dot out. And that told the, uh, the operating system to look in the current path, look in the current directory to execute that program. Um, if the program exists, it's loaded into memory and it gets its own virtual address space, which is what we talked about uh, in the last lecture or a couple lectures ago now. Um, it gets a process created with its unique process identifier, process ID. Uh, it begins to execute the process. And so uh, it looks at where to start, where to, what memory address is the beginning of the program. It loads those instructions and then it starts executing and going through that process that we got uh, just got done talking about. Um, remember with virtual address space now, the program thinks that it has a chunk of memory starting at address zero through two, three, Right? So it has those addresses available. We're putting data into addresses so that it can be fetched, decoded, executed, and then later results can be stored somewhere. Right? And so um, not all of this address space is available. As we talked about, some of it's reserved, some of it's for particular sections, some of it's for um, you know, the stack and the heap and other things. But you know, typically this is the address space then that's, that's, that's a contiguous block of virtual memory for this particular program. And then if this is virtual, right, then we might have uh, segments across the physical in which this stuff maps to, right, these address spaces map to. Um, OS handles pretty much all of the resources, all the disk I.O., the keyboard input, the display, uh, task switching, all of that stuff is being handled by the operating system. And so that in our programs, when it's executing, we say, okay, we need to access a file on disk, we need to access the internet. Um, you know, as far as a program's concerned, it's seamless. And the operating system goes, goes ahead and handles the necessary interrupts in order to execute those, you know, the instructions to, to communicate off of those IO mechanisms. Um, the process, uh, the operating system switch rapidly between processes, and we talked a little bit about this in the last lecture, um, and that you know you, you have a variety of processes that some may be waiting, and that uh, they're they're waiting for you know some sort of input or output uh, to come into the program that's that's slow. It's, it's, they're waiting for the disk, they're waiting for the network, maybe they're waiting for user input, and so while it's paused, if if we didn't have the ability to switch between tasks, then the system, the entire system, would just sit there and wait for that input. And so what happens then is we have the task switching and that 
we have a variety, a number of, of you know processes running at any given time, and the operating rapidly switches between all of those. And so that while this one's waiting, it goes to another process, executes a few instructions, uh, moves to the next process. And again, we're operating you know billions of instructions per second. To us as the end user here, sitting at the keyboard, uh, it seems pretty uh, you know pretty seamless, pretty transparent. Um, higher priority processes can preempt lower priority, and so you, you may see that, although again, typically uh, pretty seamless to us. Uh, you can see a context save, and that registers, flags, state of files can be saved uh, so that a new context can be loaded in, um, and then once that's done, it can be saved and that old context loaded back in to commence running. So what happens when it switches the task, right? We can't just simply dump the registers, move to a new task, new to a new process, fill those registers up or those switch those flags out um, and then continue to execute because we would lose that state and so that context is saved uh, pushed and pop back you know move back and forth as it switches between the different casts different processes All right uh, the last thing we'll talk about and this has some modern relevance here because we're dealing with uh, you know kind of the x86 instruction set as well as arm and uh, that really comes down to what are we using on kind of laptops and desktops, things that are, uh, I guess, a little bit, they're not expected to run off of battery power quite so much. Um, smart, you know, smartphones, mobile devices, tablets and things, because we, we really need to stress, we really want to stress the battery life in those, um, those are running ARM-based processors. Uh, the difference in those then is the instruction set. So RISC is reduced instruction set, CISC is complex instruction set. Um, with this, with RISC, we have a smaller number of op codes, uh, but we have more instructions. and uh, this used to be, for anybody that maybe can go back in time a little bit, this used to be the power C, power PC debate. And that initially, you know, years ago, it was kind of power PC versus x86 and x86 won out. Um, but now because of the ultimately uh, the saving in power with this smaller op codes, uh, it's, this is now called ARM, uh, this is becoming more and more popular. Uh, with x86, we have larger op codes giving us fewer instructions, uh, but it's using a lot more power, and so it's less efficient than ARM. So, the, kind of the point is here is that just you know you you can learn. We'll learn assembly at x86. Uh, you know, trying to do something on an ARM on a mobile device that might be a little bit different because it's a different instruction set. The instruction set are the number of mnemonics, the number of op codes that we're going to be talking about here in the next lecture. Uh, that's how we execute things. So. That's all I have for today. Uh, again, kind of the big takeaway here, the primary thing was those bitwise, those logical operators, those bitwise operations. So uh, that'll be stuff that'll definitely be on the quiz. So get some practice with those. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll stop the video and I'll see you guys in the next lecture. Thanks, Mike.